Kai tu žinai, kad tu negali kalbėti ką galvoji, tai ir nekalbė. Throughout the 20th century, the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics expanded its influence on nearly half of Europe. The encounter of this empire has left long-lasting effects on once prominent countries such as Lithuania. Nevertheless, the people of this Baltic state became temporarily united by the revolution against the empire. Ultimately, their determination for freedom brought upon the collapse of the Soviets, but the psychological toll on Lithuanians has yet to fully heal. Lithuania was once a country of warriors, with an empire that stretched from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Upon the alliance with the Soviet Union, they soon became a country of prisoners, victims of a system that confines innocent people. In 1939, they had signed the Mutual Assistance Treaty with the Soviets, agreeing to the following terms. Most notably was the transfer of Vilnius to Lithuania. Politicians understood that this treaty was a serious threat to Lithuanian independence. The popular saying was Vilnius Mosu Lietuvau Rusu. After the treaty was signed, Lithuania lost its neutrality and could not independently execute its foreign policy. From then on, it was a Russian satellite. The Soviets issued an ultimatum on June 14, 1940, which the Lithuanians unconditionally accepted. Soviets took control of government institutions, installed a new pro-Soviet government, and announced elections to the people's Siamas. The Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic was incorporated into the Soviet Union on August 3, 1940. During that time, Joseph Stalin controlled the people through terror while also broadcasting a cult of personality over supervised media. His propaganda of public image gave Stalin a presence as an almighty leader and savior. Under his rule, Soviet Lithuania would be converted from a peasant society into industrial superpower. His plan set forth government control of the economy and included the forced collectivization of Soviet agriculture. Farmers who refused to abide by his orders were exiled or killed. These actions led to a widespread famine to which many fell victim. Stalin also expanded the powers of the NKVD, which became his direct instrument for use against the party in the country during the Great Terror. The secret police remained the most powerful and feared Soviet institution throughout the Stalinist period. His terror caused a great widespread encouragement for citizens to spy on one another. Thus, from 1941 to 1946, 150,000 Lithuanians were sent to the gulags. These gulags fell victims to immensely high death rates due to the combination of violence, extreme climate, rigorous labor, sparse food rations, and unsanitary conditions. Mama, mama buvo politinė kalinė, nes senai neaždavo kariams, kurie pavojų iš nepriklaus samybę maistą, prisakydavo jiems maistą. Tai buvo neleidžiama daryti, nebėgdavo paslapčia. Ir man atrodo, kad kažkas tai jie išdavė. Žinai, buvo suimta ir sustaika nei. In 1941, Lithuania was also invaded and occupied by Nazis. Infuriated by Stalin's atrocities, many Lithuanians at first welcomed the German invaders as liberators. Signs later emerged that Adolf Hitler intended to treat his eastern conquests as occupied territories. By July 1944, Soviet forces crossed the Lithuanian border and had reoccupied most of the country by the end of the month. Infuriated by continuous injustices, by the spring of 1945, about 30,000 Lithuanians were actively fighting Soviet rule. Within the following year, the resistance became a national movement and adopted the name Lietuvos Laisvės Kovos Saivitis. Partisans were known simply as Mishko Prole. In many regions of the country, the Soviets ruled the day while insurgents controlled the night. To retaliate, Major A.M. Sokolov of the Soviet secret police was brought to Lithuania as a counterinsurgency specialist. Sokolov captured former Lithuanian insurgents and bribed them to rejoin active partisan groups as spies along with undercover Soviet soldiers. Such deceptive operations spread paranoia and provoked counterproductive partisans. Further, within regions most sympathetic to partisans, terror tactics were employed such as the mutilation and public display of partisan corpses. By the early 1950s, the Mishko Prole had grown desperate. With the Soviet intelligence anticipating their every move, they concentrated their activities against the Lithuanians suspected of collaborating with the enemy. Many innocent victims fell to such reprisals, further alienating a population wary of war. 
Stalin's death in 1953 put an end to the mass deportations. However, Soviet propaganda portrayed the Mishko Prole as agents of privilege in Western imperialism. Ultimately, by the mid-1950s, Lithuanians felt they had no choice but to come to terms with Soviet occupation. By 1965, the partisans had almost entirely died out. But the legend of Mishko Prole became the subject of Lithuanian folklore and thus contributed to the re-emergence of nationalist feelings. Therefore, in 1988, the Lithuanian Democratic Anti-Communist Movement, Sajutis, revived. In 1989, the parliament approved Declaration of Lithuanian Sovereignty, stating that Lithuanian laws take precedence over Soviet ones. That same year, on August 23rd, Lithuania performed a peaceful demonstration with Latvia and Estonia. Approximately 2 million people joined their hands to form a human chain known as the Baltic Way, spanning 675.5 kilometers across the three Baltic states. While demonstrating desire for independence, it also illustrated solidarity among the three nations. Following this, the Lithuanian Communist Party, led by Alkirtas Brazauskas, split from the Soviet Union Party. In January of 1990, the current Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, begged Lithuanian communists to return, but they refused. Later, on March 11th, the Lithuanian parliament, led by Vytautas Landsbergis, proclaimed re-establishment of Lithuania's independence. However, the Kremlin refused to recognize this and opposed an economic blockade on the country. Thus, Lithuania agreed to suspend independence pending talks with Moscow. But by 1991, no headway was made and the economy faced turmoil, so Landsbergis ended the suspension. Following this, on January 10, 1991, Gorbachev issued an ultimatum urging the recognition of the USR's rule in Lithuania, but Landsbergis refused to obey. The next day, Soviet troops stormed the press palace in Vilnius, and thousands of unarmed people started to hold vigils near the parliament, TV tower, as well as the radio and television headquarters. On the night from January 12th to January 13th, after beating nearby civilians, these places were occupied by Soviet tanks and soldiers. A parliament defender passionately stated, the intention is not to win because we all know that this is impossible. The intention is to die, but by doing so, to make sure that Moscow can't tell any lies as they did in 1940, to make sure that the whole world knows that Lithuania was prepared to fight for their freedom. During those attacks, 14 civilians were killed and some 1,000 injured. Marked as the day that changed the world, it's remembered in the hearts of every Lithuanian. January 13th is the day that Lithuanians were most united. That year in February, a referendum was in favor of Lithuania's independence. Through the bloodshed by honorable victims, partisans, and citizens, Lithuanians had achieved their goal. Soon after, with other countries following in their footsteps, Gorbachev resigned as there is no empire left to rule. Today, Sayudis is still active, but it has lost almost all of its influence. It failed to maintain unity among the people and was ineffective coping with the economic crisis. One only hopes that this culture will be able to revive itself from what was left from the SSR. Embraced into the totalitarian state by force and deceit in the middle of the 20th century, and having suffered so much violence on part of the system, we have become supporters of the culture of violence and are unable to live without abuse.